second. Okay, I think it should have started recording. Okay, so um, so what I was basically saying was summarizing this. If I take that, you know, harvesting model with type three functional response, uh, there is this very interesting phenomenon of irreversibility. No, 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 not point quite irreversibility. Uh, you know, hysteresis. The type one had irreversibility because here, once the extinction happens, you are just gone. No, nothing will take it back unless you introduce new population. Okay. However, here it's something more interesting in my opinion. We have we are in a very low population state, but you have to reduce the harvesting to values below two to recover the high population density equilibrium. Okay, this is called hysteresis. Okay, again, you know all these concepts are also explained in that uh, uh, you know a review article I have asked you to read uh, by Sheffer et al. Uh, it's titled uh, "Catastrophic Shifts in Ecosystems." So, and uh, so, what this model basically shows are there are some interesting ecological consequences of uh, you know uh, of this kind of nonlinear feedbacks in the system. Okay. So, uh, so I will stop here. Now, so please play around with both the codes I have sent. It will be useful for understanding uh, various phenomena that happens. So, I just okay. had a question there. Ah. Uh, so. Like these stable, whatever these stable uh, states correspond to the number of points H intersects with uh, the other rate that is uh, growth rate, right? What uh, is it again? Uh, the, the, the number of uh, stable states uh -huh. that we have now, we have like I think more. I, it, does it like mean that it's just intersecting at more points? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So if you were to plot the function f, the entire right hand side, it is intersecting the x axis at more and more points. So, so it just depends on the nature of those functions. Like if you if you have a different sort of curve, you'll get more. If we have a I'll say, uh, you have sigmoidal, order curve, you'll get like three points or four points. Like exactly. Yeah. 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 You're right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Okay. So suppose I so in this. This is what I was trying to say, you know. So, so there are two branches and an unstable branch in between. So what's happening is that uh, if you increase H, you know, system will follow this track. And okay. your screen. Will, huh? Sorry. We can't. At least I can't. Oh, so I haven't shared the screen. Sorry. Okay. So I was just plotting this. I was saying the same thing using the graph now. This is, you know, type three functional response, okay? Or the, you know, hold, uh, this is the sigmoid function. So, so up to an H, let's call this HC1, okay? You are in the upper branch, upper uh, larger population value. At this time, the population collapses. Now, if you now reduce, okay, if you now reduce the value of H, okay, if you say if you go that way, and then if you now reduce, it doesn't go back right here, but you have to continue along this, and then only you recover, which is at some other threshold value, let's see. Okay, does it make sense? So this phenomenon, you know, is called uh, hysteresis. Which is also a phenomenon you may have learned in, in magnetism, by the way, in uh, high school magnetic, some uh, somewhere you would have you may have learned about this phenomenon called hysteresis, and it's uh, analogous to that. And uh, a paper by Sheffer et al. Two thousand one. That paper provides many empirical examples, you know, that show these type of features. So uh, examples of abrupt shifts, example of what is called hysteresis. Okay, so it actually provides uh, you know uh, empirical evidence for this. So has anyone read those? By the way, I read the paper. Uh -huh. okay. 
Okay, so that's all I wanted to quickly summarize before moving forward today. Uh, the next, the next thing I wanted to touch upon before it was that of uh, stochasticity, which we began thinking about. Yesterday. Okay, so let's again take the case of the harvesting model. How do we introduce stochasticity? Is a very interesting problem because we know that the real systems are stochastic. Therefore, we want to introduce stochasticity to understand these systems better. Okay. So uh, uh, now, now it's always useful to think what is the process that you have in my in your mind that you want to introduce stochasticity. So one example that I did not have time to discuss is I think Pranav's group, Pranav Tarun and others. What they did was they said. Uh, you know, stochasticity uh, is not arising from either of the processes here, but it is something independently that's being added, you know, to the entire growth rate. Is that right, Pranav, or anybody from that group? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, for the simplicity of notation, let's call this entire thing as F of N. Okay, then what their group was saying was dn by dt, is f of n, the deterministic growth function, plus a stochastic term, which I am denoting by eta of t. Okay. Uh, that means that the stochastic term is being added to the growth rate. The growth rate itself is stochastic for reasons which is independent of the processes we have considered here, right? So the processes we have considered here are computation, right? Intraspecific computation, and this is that of harvesting in this case, you know. And uh, we are, you know, what they're saying is, you know, uh, stochasticity is arising. Uh, one way to think about this stochasticity is arising independent of these factors. Therefore, it's just a random addition to the uh, existing growth rate. Okay. And uh, so I don't know how exactly they modeled, uh, how exactly. So once you say something is a random number, you have to define a whole bunch of properties to it. Okay. There are a uh, few crucial properties are that of the mean. Okay, it's always useful to define that as zero because if it is not zero, if it has any finite value, we can always take out the finite value, the mean, uh, mean, and as a constant, right? So there's really no need to have a stochastic variable which has a non-zero mean. Do all of you agree with that? For example, imagine that it had a mean of two units for some reasons. So then I can instead of writing a mean has a value, mean is two, I could always write, Two plus eta t, where eta, eta t has a mean of zero, right? Likewise, if the mean is some arbitrary constant uh, c, I could just write this as f of n plus c plus eta t, where eta t has a mean zero. Okay, so therefore the uh, so it's always good to define uh, the mean of the stochastic variable, you know, uh, to be zero, and then that makes uh, some definitions also easy. So then we have to think of how variable it is, you know. The stochastic uh, variable by definition means that they are not same every point in time, right? So therefore, we also need to define variance. Okay, so variance of, so I'm not going to write the definition of variance. I'm going to assume all of you know what is variance, okay? Oh, sorry, it's not zero. We should define it by sigma square, okay? And, uh, and again, it's often convenient to assume that sigma is, one and instead if you do have any finite variance you can take them the value of that outside here as a coefficient okay so we usually write it this way one i hope my writing is clear is that clear sigma times eta t because any any finite variance can also always be taken as a multiplicative factor okay so it's useful to define mean and variance such that the mean is zero and the variance is one okay now, uh, that is insufficient. We have to define more properties, right? What are those? You know that random numbers come, come in various flavors. For example, if the random number is a coin toss, right? You have two options, head and tail, right? Uh, and they occur at equal probability. But you can have a biased coin where head can occur at a higher probability than a uh, tail. So, so basically, just because there are many, many random numbers doesn't mean that they all have equal probability of arising. We have to define the distribution of the random number. So for all practical purposes, 
in the continuous models at least, we assume that this distribution denoted by P of eta is a Gaussian distribution. There are many mathematical reasons for doing this. There are many convenience reasons for doing this. Okay, uh, but we assume that these are Gaussian distributed with mean zero and uh, and variance one. Is that fine? Is this sufficient? Do we need to define more? Do we need to define more properties? It's sufficient. Are they sufficient? Uh, Sufficient. Sufficient. Everyone agrees? Other properties can be derived if we know these. Okay. Here is, let me ask you a following question. Eta depends on T, right? What about time dependence? But stochastic, uh, we assume uh, it to be time independent noise, right? Because you know. But I wrote this as time dependent. That means I shouldn't write this as time dependent. You could consider. Is it that possible that something case. is stochastic, uh, and uh, uh, but still have some time dependent properties? The, the autocorrelation. What is the time autocorrelation? That's a very good point. So we also have defined something called autocorrelation. So autocorrelation tells how two random numbers that are separated in in this case time, how similar they are. Okay. If they are highly similar, this autocorrelation will be will be, have a large value. If it is uh, not very similar, it will have a value of zero. Okay, it's an extremely important quantity. So we assume that for you know for you know unless there is a good reason not to do so, the autocorrelation is basically zero. Do all of you understand this notation? Are the people who don't understand this notation? The most must be because we assume this to be one. Okay. Do people understand this notation? You know, feel free to say no. I'll just explain what it means. It just basically means that if I take random numbers separated by two time units apart, so what does this mean? So this basically means the following. It's basically zero if t is not equal to t prime. If I take two random numbers which are separated by any time interval, uh, which are different time points t and t prime, and if I take product, and if I take this product many, 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 many times and do an average, we'll always get a zero. Okay. That means there, there are t and t prime. So what this basically means that, you know, why, why is zero, right? You know, you imagine that for some reason that T and T prime are correlated, they're similar. Uh, it means that if eta is positive, eta T prime is also positive, right? If both of them are positive, product of many such similar positive numbers will be effectively positive, right? Again, if both of them were negative, then again, they are similar over time and therefore this product will be again positive. Okay, but when they're totally independent, if they're happening independent of each other, we don't expect their signs to match. So therefore, this should this will be zero. Is that fine? On the other hand, when t is equal to t prime, what happens? That means it's basically the same random number, right? It's now same as the variance, basically has a value of one. Okay, one with the delta of zero. Now, I'm not going to define what is delta. It's called Dirac delta function. It's okay if you don't know. It's not particularly crucial for what we do. Okay. But, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, to rigorously mathematically define this, you do need some of these quantities. Is it clear? So the one here is an indicator function, right? Uh, one is just one. It has no, I mean, because anyway, you can use it as an indicator function, but you know, there is really no need to because instead of sigma square, I wrote one because I had taken out the sigma square anyway. So and this is not really required. So one was not required. The, the delta zero will be the same finite, right? Say that again, sorry. Ha, huh, yeah, delta zero is in. That's why, you know, 
that's why I wrote one. <laughs> okay, maybe that's why I wrote one. So uh, that's why you know. So you know, you're right. Because why do we need that? It has to do with the fact that uh, we're dealing with continuous random numbers, continuous time. Okay. Yeah. If we had discrete time, I would not write that. You know, delta zero. It would just be a chronicle delta, not a Dirac delta. Okay, sir. So there are some technical points. It's okay if you don't understand, but think of it as the follows. Think of it as sort of you know variance, which is why it's okay to write as one. One is basically the variance. That's what I meant to write. Nothing else. Okay. So you have to define these properties. Okay. Now, um, so you might. Also, the second one will be t equals to t prime, right? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Thanks for correcting that. Okay. Uh, so the basic takeaway from for you is you know. Uh, when you're defining a random number, you have to define a bunch of properties. And this is the most convenient way of doing. Of all the properties, if you ask me what is most important, is the fact that they're auto they are not correlated. The last one, you know, every time the random number you're drawing has no information about what was there in the previous instant. Okay, every random number is basically new. That's what this says. This entire property says that you know, basically these properties imply that every random number is new arbitrary and unrelated to now i'm using all possible words to make it unambiguous unrelated to previous instances Okay. And of course, the mean and variance, as I said, can always be manipulated. Okay. And now one may ask, you know, why Gaussian distribution? Because Gaussian distribution admits all values from minus infinity to plus infinity. And such a large growth rate can mess up our equation. That is actually true. But there are many reasons why it is still okay to have Gaussian distributions. Okay. But I'm not going to go into much more details of it. Okay. It has to do with the fact that even if you do choose other random distribution other distributions because of central limit theorem the results will look basically same as what to do with the Gaussian distribution okay that's the first part of what i wanted to do the next thing i want to say is the following now we discussed we discussed how do we discretize and numerically uh, you know uh, you know simulate Uh, the deterministic equation, right? So we, if we have this deterministic equation, we we can numerically integrate using this very simple algorithm. Right? So the question is, how do we do this for stochastic simulations? What did you all do yesterday? Did you do the following? If we have an equation of this form, uh, okay. I think before I do this, I should okay. Let's 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 stick to the what we have done so far. Okay, eta t sigma times eta t. The way I have been writing. Did you do the following? N of t plus delta t is equal to f of N of t delta t plus sigma. Is this what you did? It's an approximation, of course. This is what you all did when you did simulations yesterday. Huh? It is just gone below. Sorry? Not visible enough. Yes, now it is. Ah, now is it visible now? Is this an approximate sign here? Is this what you did yesterday? Yes. So, so we did not have we uh, did not have the delta t term for the noise. What is delta t term? Uh, uh, oh, so okay. You did not multiply this by delta t at all. Right, right, right. You. 
pure random number that you got. Okay. Yeah, so that is effectively like adding noise to the XT. Is oh, that that directly, yeah, you're basically adding noise to the final population size. You're uh, not uh, incrementing it. Ah, uh, correct. Is that right? Uh, uh, so the uh, for simulation, uh, basically we did the same thing uh, without the delta t. That's without this, without this one, right? Yeah, correct, correct. That means that if you were to reduce your delta t, you would still have the same random number. Uh, correct, correct, correct. That's okay. Is that okay? Uh, it looks like not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's it's actually not quite non-trivial. What to right, do? Right. Okay, okay. So by the way, before okay, so this is what so this is what I will try to explain today. Okay, uh, uh, so basically there are two things people have may have done this, or as you are saying, you have you have done this right. Right, one of the two. Is there anything else people have tried apart from these two? We've introduced stochasticity in parameter values. That's a very good point. Now, let's actually come go to that now. Okay. Uh, so, so far, I've shown you one type of stochasticity. Now, one can also think of stochasticity in the parameter value, right? So, for example, what all you did was, you know, harvesting, right? Many of you did was harvesting was some constant plus stochasticity is that right harvesting is randomly changing over days or some over time sometimes days okay so now if you now write down if you now go back to the if i scroll up and if i make this h here right h zero plus eta t uh, and write down the equation it will look like this is that right Plus one of this, sorry, minus h zero plus theta of t in divided by. Is it fine? Actually, maybe this is minus. Is it fine? If I expand that, I get this. Do you agree? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is very interesting, right? Why is this interesting and a contrast compared to this approach? In this approach, we just added noise to the overall growth function, right? So let's again call this entire thing f of n. Okay, let's call this as g of n then this is in the of this form. Is that right? Okay. Which is in contrast to the, this approach by Pranav's group where they added a for a random noise term to directly to f of n without with a, I don't know, uh, with a, with some variance, right? So, what is the difference between two? Interpret from an interpretation point of view, I will write that here. Um, now let's let me write this as a. Let me write this as b. So can you tell me what are the interesting differences between A and B? B, you're just adding a constant value, but in mm -hmm. A, A, it's a constant that affects a function. Function of what? Function of N. The population. Right. So the, the function of the population size itself. So uh, as um, Amir rightly said, here the noise is a function of the population 
size itself. What does what does it mean to say noise is a function of population size? If you think of this is the, this is the real noise term, right? Noise term here, right? And let me insert that sigma back here. Okay. The coefficient is the variance of other other standard deviation of noise. Is that right? So basically, again, the coefficient of this will be this is the variance of noise. So basically, in model A, the variance of noise depends on the depends on the population size itself. Okay, so if I were to write, so essentially, noise would increase if the population is larger. Variance of the function of n for the model B, it will be some value sigma. This is okay. What will it be for model A? If it's the kind of harvesting function we have chosen, okay. Uh, for model, so this is n by n zero plus n. Maximum value it takes is basically one, right? Okay. Or may okay. I mean, it like itself. So again, you know, let's do again same. So let's again assume it's the sigma has been taken out from the noise. So eta t itself has a, uh, you know. Um, uh, you know itself has a unit variance okay uh, in that case uh, again the maximum value will be sigma except that it varies with n only for large population sizes we will reach that. is that right Okay, so basically this is called the state dependent noise. Whereas this is independent, it's also called additive noise. Additive noise because you're just adding. And uh, what will be the contrast to the additive noise? Multiplicative noise, it's also called the multiplicative noise. Sorry, I'm in the writing. My writing is always pretty horrible. So multiplicative noise is the other name. So why is it why do we call it multiplicative? Because the noise term is multiplied with the state variable itself. N is the population size of the state variable. So uh, the noise variance depends on that. It's a multiplicative factor as a compared to the multiplicative factor here. The noise is an added term to the growth rate. It doesn't multiply with anything about the population size. Okay. So there are two different types of noises. Okay. This is additive. Okay. And uh, one final point before I sort of move forward is the following. The moment you write, the moment you have an equation of this form, where G depends on N. Uh, it turns out that the, all the mathematics we know previously about calculus fails, okay? Uh, because we are adding a stochastic variable to uh, the right-hand side of a derivative. And derivative, as you know, is defined under some conditions of smoothness of functions. Those all get violated. Therefore, all the calculus you know from your high school just fails. So you have to define a new calculus and there are multiple ways of doing this calculus. Okay, so without going into all the technical details, uh, we will use something called Eto calculus. Unfortunately, I won't tell you what it is and what are the other calculus. Uh, but the thing is, uh, if, say if you were to use such an equation, but if you don't tell what calculus you're using, people will uh, uh, make fun of you. So you should tell them that you are using Eto calculus, even if you don't know what else are possibly possibilities. Okay. So what exactly it is and, uh, and those, in fact, I usually cover those in my advanced course. Okay. Uh, so that's where I wanted to stop before moving a little bit, trying to understand a little bit more. Okay, about now we have introduced some randomness and you know, this randomness is really important for a lot of factors in ecology. Are there any quick questions before I move forward? 
yeah uh, wish you, um, we i i don't know where it falls under these two categories mm-hmm. so we had a slight modification to the um, the state uh, the a form that is you know s is equal to h not plus eta t we did not do that what we did is um, because what we saw is when you plot h it's just a jittery version of h is how we saw it so we thought mm-hmm. of um h t is equal to h t minus 1 plus eta t something on the lines of correlated random walk because your harvesting rate depends on your yesterday's harvesting rate and not like some random version oh, like the baseline thing so the so when you see the uh, h versus time it's not this jiggly 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 where mm-hmm. the mean is around h and mm-hmm. with some right it's like so, sort of smooth and slowly drifting up and drifting down okay okay and and that was meaningful for us is because like you know if uh, in the noisy version if the h is above a threshold for a long enough time only then we see extinction here because it's slowly oh. drifting we do see extinctions often and we do so- see not extinctions often so i don't know what do okay. you call this. yeah i understand what you're saying so basically you're trying to maybe introduce eta t to be correlated which is also fine by the way that's ecologically highly relevant uh, but there is one reason why people don't do that uh, the moment you say there is a correlation in the noise So why do we add noise? Let us understand why do we add noise? Why do we add noise to these models? Because in much of the cases, the real world itself has these variability which we not necessarily are aware where it's coming from, but it's sort of right. Aware. Exactly right. So the idea of adding noise uh, is that um, we have our model does not capture all the processes, and but we do know there are many many other processes. that are unknown okay and uh, and they are time varying in a very rapid way and uh, they don't have any clear structure okay uh, if you knew there was a structure to it you must also model the structure the moment you think there is a structure you must always model it writing some other equation okay so the reason why people don't add correlated noises it's correlated noise adding the correlated noises same as saying there is a process which i am not modeling i'm being slightly lazy here about modeling it uh but uh, the reason why people then do uh, you know i you know uncorrelated noises that you know i have modeled everything that's important whatever remains is basically pure randomness entirely um, unknown randomness which sure, is why I, I, people use you know the you know this uh, uncorrelated noise yeah i just had a question how do, how does the computer make produce noise ha ah, that's a great question um how do you think it produces you use some physical process i don't know what the physical process the computer the computer if you give a number it must if you want if it wants to give back another number it has to use some function right one one way function ha huh? one way functions one way function what's the one way function like uh, if you give an input uh, like it gives some uh, the output can be correlated back to input output is output can be cannot be correlated back to the input ah so well, there are such functions is it one way functions yeah, i think uh, like uh, it's the basis for the like pseudo random number generators so, but why do you call it pseudo random number like you use an initial value and then like use that to create uh, random hmm. numbers okay but see doesn't tell what is that hmm? doesn't tell what is it if you can use temp so basically uh, basically like, you can use uh, uh, uh basically there is some uh, input there is some function that takes some input and gives back some output right if, yeah and if the if there is a one to one mapping between input and output it's not random anymore deterministic yeah like uh, you use the current value as a seed for the next one current value of what current value of the random number so the random number generator as input for the next uh, iteration but if it's using a function you know what i if i know the outcome how is it random so like it depends on the initial first value you take if it's a very if it's no no very, forget i just like let me say i want a new one random number hmm how will you generate it so like uh, the first value you should uh, like ideally take it from uh, like some physical processes maybe no, no, like... let's i will give you i will give you the first don't worry about the first hmm. i just tossed the coin and gave you zero or one yeah for random no 
Hmm. But this is the first and second one be correlated with you. Like, why can't they be independent attempts of it? Like, to be able, do we really have to figure out what is the next iteration from the current? Yeah. Iteration? The thing is, you know, it's generally animals uh, quite non-trivial. By the way, this is the whole point I want to make. So let me let me do something very interesting though. How you might generate uh, random numbers? Um, do you remember what happens to this model? For very large values of R zero, which is in R. So we can uh, use the like chaotic regime values of this function as random number generators. Yeah, that's what people do. That's I mean not the logistic model, but slightly more complex models. It turns out that the in the chaotic regime, these that now series of them not only any given number. So what we already know is that even if you start with two very small initial conditions, the trajectory is diverged massively, right? That we know. Okay, not only that, you know, it so happens that uh, you know, uh, for any given, if you give an input, the output, although you know, deterministically what the heck it is, it's actually a very simple quadratic equation. Uh, it appears as if it's, it, it it actually satisfies many 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 properties of random numbers. In fact, crucially, what is the property we want to satisfy? We want to satisfy this property, right? This autocorrelation must be zero. So for there are some regimes of the chaotic chaos where in fact a chaotic time series looks like a true random series. But as we know, it's not a true random series because I'm actually using a deterministic function, right? So some modifications of the chaotic maps are actually used to generate uh, random number series. And uh, why are and, you know Bevan was using a term called pseudo random numbers why do they call them pseudo random numbers because they are not truly random you know what the number is going to generate yeah um, like it's more pseudo easier random, huh? like i guess but is there any easier. way or easier compared to what like uh, getting a true random number how do you get, how do you ever get a true random number it's worth thinking how do you ever get a true random number you will have to like take some physical processes you Sorry, should say some physical device. processes are random all I'm not sure. Like uh, it's not very like, easy. It's not very easy. Yeah. You know? so because it's pretty physical process also follows some thing, you know, some physical laws. And you know how to characterize them, you know how to predict future, right? So, so getting random numbers is quite a non-trivial problem. But of course, the people have found out many, many workarounds. They produce fantastic random numbers. There are many, many algorithms, but all of them depend on some pseudo-random numbers or generators. People say that there are some properties of quantum mechanics one can use to generate true random numbers, but I don't, I don't know that. I don't know what is the state of the art in this. Okay, so let me now move on because we are talking so much about randomness. Let's talk about uh, a, a phenomenon of um, an animal moving in a landscape. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, let us say that, let us assume the following conditions. Let us say that the resources are very sparsely distributed. Okay. And animal has no knowledge of resources. Is that fine? Now tell me how should animal move to find the source? Or rather, what's the starting point for modeling how animal move in the landscape? Brownian motion. Brownian motion. So we gave uh, a definition of a process. Okay, but just something more simple words for those who have not have heard of this. Randomly. <laughs> Uh, they move randomly, exactly, right? So, Random because work. resources are sparse and then they don't have any knowledge of resources. So, at every decision making step, just move randomly. Okay, so let's assume for the sake of simplicity that uh, the animal movement can be restricted to one dimensional space. In an effective It's not a necessary condition, by the way. It's only for the algebraic simplicity in the class today. No? 
and in fact but this does happen can you think of real uh, uh, instances when uh, when this is true when this is a reasonable approximation think of an animal moving along the river stream the serengeti the migration which happens think of vibration What is Serengeti? Migration? No, Serengeti migration. That oh, happens. migration, migration. But that's a huge two-dimensional landscape. Why is it one D? Okay. But I think a simpler example, in my opinion, is along river, unbranching river. Yes. Right. Uh, rivers, of course, are two-dimensional. Land, but if you think about the length of the river and and then think of the width of the river in comparison to the length, it's effectively a one-dimensional. Landscape is that right? Yeah, also uh, a coastline, for example, like exactly coastline. coastline. Uh, animals that move along coastlines, right? Excellent example. Okay, so there are many other examples one can think of, or a or a migratory corridor, where you really you know I mean you know one one reason why Serengeti migration might be valid is if there is a narrow corridor over which they are moving, then one dimensional uh, landscape might be actually okay to think. Okay, and you know and so on. Okay. So effectively, in those cases, they are moving in one direction. Okay, so let's assume that animal in, in that we are considering also does the same. So let's assume that it moves in some discrete time steps. Again, I am doing this for mathematical simplicity. It moves, moves randomly in discrete. Time steps. Again, it's not a necessary condition. It's not a crucial condition. Again, one can generalize very easily for non-discrete time steps also. Okay. Okay. So, so now uh, let us write down some equations that correspond to this. What could be an equation that corresponds to it? Um, uh, let's denote x t as location. I'm sorry that we are using X T again of animal at time t. Is it okay? Can you think of a better notation than X T for spatial location? So we don't overlap with logistic model and stuff. Or is it okay? You don't mind. It's okay. Small X. Small X. Ah, uh, well, yeah, there's some. Okay, we will stick to this. Okay, uh, you, uh, so looking at location of animal now, not population density. Okay, maybe I can call it Z if it helps. Maybe yes, let's call it Z. Z is usually used for third dimension, vertical dimension, but it's okay. Okay, and um, let's say zero Z zero was the initial location. Is that fine? Wherever it started. Okay, now, uh, and uh, if Z T was the current location, it must have come from some Z T minus one, right? Okay. So let's say Z T minus one was the previous location. How do you arrive at Z T by moving randomly, right? That means I just add a random number to it. Do you agree with this? So, how much distance to move is a random number? Is that fine? So, animal is at location z t minus one, and uh, the new location is a random number added to its previous location. Is that fine? Okay, let's denote that by z t minus one plus eta t as before. Okay. So now the moment we define a well, moment to introduce a random number to an equation, what should we do? We must write down the properties of the random number. Okay, what shall we choose for the mean of this? 
what do we like the mean of this to be zero hmm? zero meaning because it has no preference anyway uh, it may move in the left direction let's say you know if it's a one dimensional space like this if this was the location it could have moved here it could have moved here right so on an average it could have moved in both directions equally likely therefore we assume that the average is zero fine so we now have to also make some assumption about the variance Let's assume it is sigma square. Okay. Some variance. What about the distribution? Shall we assume something about the distribution and what would you like it to be? Normal distribution. Okay, you can also choose other distribution. It doesn't have to, okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be normal, but let's since somebody said normal, let's also assume that probability distribution of n is a normal distribution. Which basically means okay. For those of you who don't know, this is a standard definition of standard way of writing uh, the fact that this equation basically means that eta is a normal distributed uh, random. Number with mean zero and variance. So second first term is the mean, second is the variance. Fine. This is a standard notation to say this way. Okay. So we have defined the equation for how the animal is moving. Okay. As I said, this can be easily generalized to two dimension. Okay. In fact, I will leave it as an exercise for you. You can now consider x and y as two direction. You can just write down an equation for the x as well as y. How x t is changing over time and how y t is changing over time. You will have instead of one now two random numbers, right? One along the x axis, one along the y axis. Okay. Uh, and the, and then just repeat all the calculations that we do today, and then that will uh, whatever we find, you will find them to be true. Okay. So we have written an equation for the random. Movement. Is it fine? Any questions on this so far? Okay, no questions. Let's go to the next page. So, what we have done is written down the animal movement in terms of equation. Let us see what is the have, so z you know let's say given some value of z t minus one okay i have added a random number to it is z t also a random number now yes yes, yes. so basically that was some given value and then i have added a random number to it. therefore z t is a random number therefore i can also define a mean for z t is that right what do we mean for z t mean for z t is mean of z t minus one plus mean of eta t. Is that fine? What is mean of eta t? That is zero. What does that mean? Mean location at time t is same as the mean location at time t minus one. Do you agree? Can I apply this recursively now? Can I claim that z t minus one is equal to z of t minus two? Because same thing has happened in the previous time step, right? There was some location z t minus two and the random number was added. A random distance was added to it, right? So I got z t minus one. So therefore, if I were to write down an equation like this, and then if I repeat the calculation, will I not find this? Right? Does anyone have a problem with this? And if I keep on writing this, what will I find? Z1 equal to Z0, which was the initial equation. 
Is everyone happy with this? So what is the consequence of this? So basically I can replace, so Zt average is same as Zt minus one, but we know this is true. Therefore this can be written as Zt minus two, right? Average. Now we know that the same will be true between T minus two and T minus three. Therefore again, I can replace this by T minus three, T minus four and so on, so on, so on. Z one and finally Z zero, right? So if I do this recursively, what do I find? The average location of the animal after t time steps is basically same as the starting location. Does that make sense? And why is this happening? It's primarily happening because um, uh, noise is additive. Because, because uh, well, noise is additive is one, mean. and secondly, mean is noise mean is zero because noise it can uh, the animal could have gone left or right if equal probability, right? And therefore, on an average, you go nowhere. Okay. Any questions so far? So. Um, is this so you all have to remember from your high school physics um, what is called displacement right what is the displacement by the way displacement is displacement between two time units will be the final location minus the initial location right is that correct Let's denote this by D. So what will be the average D? What is the average displacement? Zero. Zero. Okay. Okay. Fine. So now let's do something more useful. But does it mean the animal hasn't moved? It has moved, right? Okay, yeah. so there's a difference between distance traveled and the displacement. Let us not try to focus on distance traveled. And one way to do that is instead of worrying about displacement, if you just square the displacement, what happens? That sine, a factor of sine just goes through. Is that right? Okay. So let's again write down the, let's now focus on the squared displacement. Which sort of measures, measures more of the distance. Not truly, of course, the distance traveled will be a slightly different, but you know, sort of one can sort of think of it as a better measure. Okay, so how, what, how do we think about this? Now we remember that animal moves using this equation. What a crazy animal it must be to draw random numbers from computers and move. Okay, this is how the animal is moving. So to know the displacement uh, square, what do we need to do? We need to find. Uh, okay. The square of this. Is that right? Let us square the entire equation. We get z t minus one square two eta t z t and then eta square of t. Fine. Let's take the average in the entire equation. Is that fine? Okay, so of course, we want to find the relationship between Z T square and Z T minus one square. So we just keep it the way it is. What is this term? So two is a constant that can be taken out, right? 
Uh, I think that will be Z T minus one, right? Oh, you are right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Two is a constant that can be taken out. What about eight R T and eight Z T minus one? Are they dependent on each other? They are independent. Of so data T is drawn to add to Z T minus one. No, it's drawn independent of this. So when you have two independent random numbers. They, the the product of them will be same as the product of the averages okay this is a standard result in uh, basic random numbers okay so i can now take them as averages of products product of the averages okay and then what's the last term eta t square average that is nothing but variance is that right because the mean of this is zero the second moment and the variance become same Okay. Uh, now, what is this term? What I'm is the sure. average? Vishu, oh, one thing uh, I'm not sure is how is z t minus one independent of eta t? I understand eta t is independent. So z t minus one is the location at time t minus one. But so that function on eta t, right? Sorry, isn't that dependent on eta t because if you go one generation before, then z t minus one is z t minus two plus eta t. So isn't it that way dependent? But on every eta eight. Okay, sorry, sorry. So maybe I should write down this notation. What was the notation we used? Uh, technically, I should. Minus one is dependent on t minus one only, right? So. Yes, this is t minus one. Okay, let me write this down just to be clear. So z t minus one will be equal to z of t minus two plus eta of t minus one. T minus one. But and this so, and this are totally independent of each other, right? Every time I'm drawing, you do random. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I could have also maybe made consistent. Yeah, okay, yeah, this is the stuff that is basically. Okay, so now we know that the average of eta t is zero. Therefore, second term basically goes to zero, right? So therefore, we have a relationship between. Is that correct? So we have this new relation. Unlike the previous one, they're not equal, but they're separated by a constant value, which is nothing but the variance of the uh, noise term. Okay. So can I now write down a similar equation for t minus one? If I were to just repeat the same argument from here to here for the t minus one, will I not find the same result? Do you agree with this? Is that correct? So if I now combine these two, what do I get? Z of t square is Z t minus two whole square average plus two times sigma square. Is that fine? If I keep on using this iterative rule. We arrive at this. Is this fun? Any questions on this? Okay, and uh, uh, just like we defined uh, mean displacement, we now define a quantity called mean 
squared displacement. What will that be? That is basically ZT minus Z0 whole square. Okay. And it's average. Okay. So let us look at this term. So ZT minus Z0 was the displacement. All of you agree with that? And ZT minus 0 me are the, okay, let's go to the previous page. Look at the bottom. Displacement was ZT minus Z0. We want the mean displacement was zero. Is that fine? So what we are now doing is mean square displacement. We have taken the displacement, we have squared it, and then we have taken the mean. Okay. So what is this? This is z t squared plus z zero square minus two z zero z t. Okay. Um, if you do the simplification, I'm going to avoid the algebraic steps. We'll find that this is same as this. Uh, primarily because the average of zt is same as z0. So this entire term basically becomes 2z squared. And z squared minus 2z squared will be this. Is that fine? And now, if I now combine this with this, what do I get? Uh, mean square displacement zt minus square minus z square, which is same as take this to the left hand side, right? Or I can substitute zt square from here. Z0. What is the average of z0 square? Z0 is a constant anyway, right? So average, average of z0 square is z0. So why did but, we take minus in z0 square? It should be plus, no? Wait, sorry. And z t here. square from here to here. Huh. Okay, let me just show that. The first term is this, do you all agree? Yes. The second term is average of this term, which is basically z0 square, is that correct? Okay. So the next term is average of this entire thing, average of two times z0, z0 z0. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, I see. Now, the constant, the z is a constant. So this is uh, 2 z0, z0, z0. Now I get it. And this is what is average that's that t. Go back to the previous step. That's zero. That's zero. Uh, so this is two that zero square. So z zero square minus two z zero square into this. And from this equation, what will that be? That is equal to t times sigma square. What this means is the mean square displacement. Oh, bad writing. Mean square displacement is given by t times sigma square. So although the mean displacement is zero, it doesn't change with time. The mean square displacement changes with time. Is it fine? Yes, yes, understood. Makes sense, no? No, what are we do? I have being all these nonsense. Is this all nonsense? Is this something useful at all? With the calculations we have done, do you think we can do something useful? Yeah, we can find how they migrate or something, how they move all those things. Mm -hmm. How? How much will give us from mean square displacement? How sorry? How much we can get from mean square displacement? What do you mean by how much can we get from mean square displacement? How much they have moved? How much they move? Uh, what was your question? Say that again. So, so far, what I have found is we assume if we assume that animals move randomly, which we know is probably not true, right? We make what do we make? We make two predictions.
do what I call measurable predictions. They are not just predictions. They are actually measurable predictions. Sort of unlike chaos, which is much more difficult to measure. What's the first one? The mean displacement. is zero, right? Second one is mean square displacement is proportional to T. Is that right? Okay, now, which means that if you did have an animal, okay, let me just say that it is also true for two-dimensional random walks, okay? What this means is that say if you had x and y coordinates of animals like this, okay, which is x0, x1. I'm using x0 to mean the entire vector, by the way, okay. Uh, this is x2, okay. If you had all these locations over time, Okay. This is whatever xt, the last one. Okay, if we had all these locations, you can do the following. Right? You can calculate uh, the you know what is the displacement for one time unit. Let's take the smallest time unit possible in your data. Right, uh, you can calculate the mean. You know from the data you can compute me MSD for one unit of time, okay, for example, find this displacement, find this displacement, find this, for each of them find the displacement and then square for each of them and then do an average and find the mean square displacement one time. Again, do it for two unit times, meaning come take x0 and x2, find the displacement, find x2 and x4, find the displacement, take x1, x3, find the displacement, Again, for each of these space separated by two time minutes, find a displacement and keep on doing it. From such a measurement, what, you, what can you do? You can actually plot in the data, what is the mean square displacement as a function of time? Is that correct? If it is truly random walk, what do you expect? It will be a straight line, right? because it varies with time. This is for the random. Walk. But of course, what happened, you know, but it's, you know, but you know, it's, un, you know, it might be difficult to expect that animals do exact random walk. They might be doing much more complicated, right? Let's consider one extreme where animals are migrating. Uh, won't it be, uh, more uh, like uh, you can consider uh, plants uh, pollination or something like that without the presence of wind so propagation of plants or vegetation pollination hmm. plant Won't pollination from what uh the propagation of vegetation seeds. in uh, propagation of seeds in yeah yeah seed dispersal yeah seed dispersal is yeah. that is so you're thinking of seed moving at to a random distance from the parent tree yeah, yeah. Okay. That or in general, grass uh, growth. Okay. Grass growth. Okay. So, so you're connecting it to population dynamics, right? Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, like I'm asking whether won't that be a better example than animals uh, doing randomly? Like, uh, so as you pointed so? out, because you know, if you think of seed, the seed, uh, there is a parent tree and the seed gets dispersed, right? How does yeah, seed so get that's dispersed? How it's what are the mechanisms uh, to seed dispersal? Uh, small winds. Uh, winds, right? Okay, there's a wind, and that moved, uh, you know, plugged one seed and dropped at some distance. Birds. Okay. There might be another insects. seed that Birds. gets dropped by another wind in different direction, right? Yeah. Or yeah. alternatively, the animals move and disperse seeds. Hmm. Right? But then how do animals move? Yeah. And I know wind dispersal is one time event, right? But what about animal uh, 
animal made and dispersal usually animals eat seeds right so they eat fruits okay <laughs> they for the ingest seeds and they are moving in the landscape mm. and then at some point of time you know depending on their cut retention time the seed falls off okay right so even they don't you think you need to account for the random walk of animals mm. yeah true in boil some at least there are the walking of animals if not the random mm. walk yeah. of animals okay mm. okay so okay so we if we take uh, what i was trying to say here was if we think of other extreme of migrating animals what do you expect migrating animals will probably move much more in one direction right they may come back but they are more likely to be moving in one direction right in such a system what do you think that mean square displacement will be how do you think it will vary with time So to understand this, just think of what happens to displacement exponentially. Exponentially, why exponentially? They're moving more and more as the time goes, is it? No, no, no. Uh, the displacement will mm -hmm. be exponentially with time. Right? Why exponential? Let's assume a constant speed animal, which is is it reasonable? It would be same as the displacement that day, or the displacement square. Then it'll be just multiplicator of the time steps. right so displacement basically will be uh speed times the number of steps if you assume one steps per one time minute is vt right and that's usually in the one direction right and therefore msd will be which is the square root of this will be v square t square right so msd will be proportional to t square is a is a reasonable approximation for migrating animals we agree which is sort of entirely almost entirely non random right it's it's a directed motion yes yes which basically now no so basically now you can generalize you can say maybe animals neither do perfect random walk neither are they always migrating so you can maybe hypothesize or conjecture that the general form of mean square displacement is of the form t power alpha okay if alpha is equal to 1 we have what we call random walk it's also called um, brownian motion if alpha is equal to 2 we have what we call ballistic motion ballistic is you know very directed you know motion and what may happen is many animals live in between this you know intermediate it's also called uh, it's still called super diffusive um random walk has many many names so random walk is also called diffusive motion it's often very slow it's very slow because you are moving randomly right okay and of course ballistic motion is very rapid because you are directed in a specific direction but what you have in between is called super diffusive motion and finally you can also have alpha less than 1 we call them sub diffusive okay does and alpha is, less than 1 means that is attracted to where they are like, sorry does alpha less than 1 mean is attracted to their point of origin so in some sense yeah possible that's one way to think about it it's not necessary by the way it's that's one way they are just stuck <laughs> they're no going no way <laughs> that suddenly will lead to super sub diffusive you got no motion stuck means they're not going no, they <laughs> come like back to their home range or something even with home range will also lead to sub diffusive motion yeah right. yeah home range will lead to territoriality will lead to sub diffusive motion 
all of them will be especially in king cobras that has been observed they come back to their home range every time they are left anywhere else yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. okay Is so but mechanism which can give us more than do some fluid dynamics where you go together so you are now faster yeah, than you can you can figures. so basically more than two can happen of course so you can have one simple way it can happen is you know when you have accelerating motion so not just constant speed when you have acceleration yeah but but there's a limit right like even if you assume if the organism is at its max speed exactly like, there is a limit then yes. i'm just trying to understand like how is it even possible like because direct yeah. motion is the most straightest way like how can you be higher than 2 absolutely you're at your max so it's, it's it's basically you're right you know, basically you only find them for a very short period of time you can't find them forever so in fact now if you now take real data usually the way to so basically if you conjecture this kind of you know relationship one good way to a plot this is not a regular plot but take the logarithm on both sides if you take logarithm of msd what do we get we get alpha times logarithm of t right so if i go back to this equation and take the logarithm i'll get this right Oh, sorry, I messed up my own writing. Okay, taking logarithm, we'll we'll get this right. So what this means is, if we actually have data, the right thing to do is to plot the following plot on the y-axis. X-axis will be logarithm of p, y y axis logarithm of means by displacement. So if a pure if we have a pure uh, Brownian motion, what we find is something like this. you know a straight line with where the slope what is the slope by the way if you fit a straight line what's the what is the slope corresponding to here angle slope corresponds to alpha right if you do this the slope becomes alpha right so if you measure the slope of this uh, log transform data then uh, the slope measures the exponent of the mean square displacement So alpha is called also called the you know random walk exponent or also called the Levy exponent. So alpha okay. So slope of this log transform data is basically will help us measure the property of the movement of animal. Okay, if it is alpha is equal to one, implies it's random walk, right? If If we have alpha is equal to two, ballistic, and then you have sub bit diffusive and diffusive, right? This entire region will be oh, super diffusive, and this will be sub diffusive. What usually happens in many many real data sets is not a single straight line, but often something more complicated. In very short time scale, you often find that they are super diffusive because on short time scales, animal might be moving in a directed fashion. but over time they switch okay to something like you know the slope in this part could be alpha is equal to 1 but the slope here can be alpha is equal to maybe 1.5 or 2 so there is you know there is a time dependent a scale dependent you know variations in this over long times it might become constant in a home range phenomenon often what happens is they become constant with time Okay, that means that they have explored the maximum area and then it doesn't increase anymore. Okay, so you will won't find one single straight line with a single slope, but rather combination of various slopes. But what this framework helps us analyze is you know to understand how how can you quantify animals moving because we can't uh, go to their brains and understand what they are thinking when they are moving. We don't know how they are exploring resources, but this provides sort of a framework. almost like a null model think of the random walk of animal movement as a null model for studying how animals move which means that they must necessarily deviate from it okay they almost surely will deviate so for understanding deviations will help us you know uh, think about the various possible ways animals might be moving but it's also possible that you find no deviations in fact in many many species you find no deviation from random walks they do appear random walks 
and uh, and one there is actually a very interesting result that says that uh, this sub you know, super diffusive movement is actually an optimum way of moving for searching resources for searching sparse unknown resources any questions on this so that so, means they are highly likely to find uh, say something food or something if they follow this move exactly in the super diffusive region somewhere in this okay. in this you know in fact super diffusive with uh, alpha closer to 1.5 in fact there are many many species where they do find evidence for these type of these type of patterns which you have a uh, one doubt like Yeah. like the problem is this completely i understand this a simplified model it completely ignores the sensory aspect of an organism like absolutely true i agree like you look at the trajectory you have a gps data of a bird or a whale or something and it and when you fit the data it looks super diffusive great but now if you make a a robot or a or a dumb robot which fits the same distribution and the same behavior i don't think the the robot will be able to find the food because i think the organism at some point in time besides the coarse uh, stochastic movement it actually uses the sensory cues of smell taste and vision so how do we incorporate that because just because your random model fits the animal's distribution doesn't mean the animal is using that I, I, that's the part where i'm disconnect from biology from modeling is what i have huh. you are you are right there it doesn't mean that the animals are moving randomly if you find that uh, if you find uh, some pattern what this does mean is that i can explain my results by us without having to account for complex sensory details now the question is now uh, is it a satisfactory explanation or uh, do you need to how do we interpret this now let's think about the following it's actually an issue of scales if you think about this right now if uh, you know it's possible that the sensory perception uh, in the context of let us say uh, this is a context that we are interested in right searching for sparse unknown resources right uh, which means i'm not seeing anything right now okay so where should i go okay uh, which is not same as if i am within 10 meters of a resource which i can now see what should i do of course in that time scale you must of course do ballistic motion towards that resource but however on the time scale larger where unknown factors play a more important role that's when the randomness becomes important and it's also one of the reasons why the short time results are often closer to ballistic motion in real world data because on short term animals are moving ballistically towards some targets okay uh, but uh, but but uh, if you account for the fact over long time scales the turns that they make will make it eventually random movement is the basic idea does it make sense yeah yeah no but like but, but the reason i'm like if you look at these trajectories of these kites and birds who migrate for like 20 years uh -huh. their trajectory yeah. they don't look by any means random it's like there is a there's a very local scale where as you said it's directed motion ballistic and going towards it and there's this intermediate stage where you know they're sort of meandering around and then you get look at the globe level scale they are going through the same paths of through the gulf of mannar or like through some particular parts of geographical features like i'm talking about at the continental scale so i find it like you know we are explaining some parts of it but i know it's very unclear like what can we make out of this that's unclear ha huh. so you see uh, migratory systems are uh, sort of you know we will get alpha closes to for migratory systems and you know this is not a very useful framework for studying migratory systems right it's only useful for studying uh, foraging in that you know sparse environments so migratory systems are a bit different right you know because they have a uh, sort of you know uh, inbuilt memory or learned learned roots from parents and they go towards those directions right so it's actually a ballistic motion on those large scales so migratory movements 
uh, come in this limiting case of alpha is equal to two, and they are in some sense the least interesting application of this framework. Okay. They are interesting on you know for other organisms where the these kind of long distance migrations are not really happening. Makes sense. Okay. okay, so I think what's the time now? We are at three thirty-five. Any questions uh, right now? I just want to do one last thing with uh, uh, you know uh, if you don't if you don't mind. Let's now go back to the population model. Okay. Okay, so we wrote this equation, right? dn by dt is equal to f of n plus g of n times a of t for the stochastic population. And we were asking this question, what to do in this context? How do we numerically simulate this? So this, this part was so we wrote this possible uh, equation. Is that correct? Uh, let us assume the following. Let us assume that n is equal to z, which is the position of animal. Is that fine? See, n can be any variable. No, it doesn't have to be population density, right? This is a general equation, right? N could be concentration of chemicals. N could be anything you like, right? So let's call n is equal to position of the animal. Is that fine? Okay. So in that context, uh, uh, let's think, uh, you know, then we will uh, change the variables. Uh, so then what does F mean? What does what is the meaning of f? So what was f doing in the population context? In the context of population, f was pushing towards some equilibrium values, right? Some equilibrium values of population sizes. What would that mean in this case? It would mean that the animal is being put to some locations, right? There might be some preferred locations, for example. Is that right? So zeros of f correspond to preferred locations of s and uh, uh, are the equilibrium positions of the animal. Is that right? Would you agree with that interpretation? f of z is equal to zero corresponds to equilibrium positions of animal. Do you agree? Silence. Yes. Okay. Let me make oh, one yes. more claim now. F prime, if the equilibrium is stable, this implies that star corresponds to preferred location of animals. Do you agree? Because if you move and if animal moves away from that, it will come back to that position. Is that right? Is it too much of a, too much of an abstraction right now, everyone? It makes sense. Okay, makes sense. Okay, and let's assume for the time, for the sake of simplicity, g of z is equal to constant. Okay, is that fine? And then let's assume that the animal has no preferred locations, meaning there is nothing that's pushing or pulling animals towards anywhere. Then uh, what happens? Uh, oh, actually, I'm so I'm in the discretization. I have missed one crucial step. Sorry. NT, sir. NT uses NT. No, is that correct? NT plus of all of this. Is that fine? 
So g of z is equal to constant. Let's assume that there are absolutely no preferred location of animals, which means f of z is zero throughout all wells of z. Is that fine? Are you all fine with this? So then what happens to this equation now? N of t plus delta t is equal to N of t plus sigma eta t delta t. Is that correct? How all of you find with this? Okay, now, now there is some more algebra. I, don't, I hope you can tolerate this. I know it's going to be a long class today. Let's take the mean of this equation. Mean of this will be mean of this plus mean of this, right? Mean of this is zero. So what do we get? Is equal to, so mean, oh, why am I writing here? I should write that down, sorry. Okay. okay, that's fine. We have, we agree with the statement. Let us do the variance of this entire statement, entire uh, expression, okay? Uh, what do we get in that such a case? Z of T plus Delta T whole square is equal to z of t whole square two sigma eta t. I hope I'll get this calculation right. Huh? It's a bit non-trivial. Okay, and then the square of this entire thing. Sigma square, eta square, delta t square. Is it fine? And uh, and this term, what happens with the intermediate term, like in the previous random walk analysis, this goes to zero if I take the average, right? And then therefore we get Z of T plus Delta T whole square averages, Z T square average plus Sigma square. What is eta square um, average? I said it's just one, no? We have assumed it's like a you know, standard Gaussian. Delta T square. Is that correct? This is what we found. Algebraically, is everything fine? Yes, sir. Okay, but tell me, you remember what we proved in the in a couple of slides ago? By the way, what is if I take this to the left hand side now? What happens? It's basically the mean square displacement between some small time interval, right? Right? It's the mean square displacement with some, some small time interval that is same as sigma square delta t square. Okay, but what did we find in the previous result? Mean square displacement with, for, for the interval t is proportional to time interval. It was not t square, right? Whereas here we found this to be t delta. The, the time interval was delta t in this case. It became delta t square. Isn't that a problem? Do you see some inconsistency here? Okay, so it require. I know. I understand this will require some thinking. This actually is indeed inconsistent. What we really want is this, this mean square displacement must be sigma square times delta t to be consistent with what we found about random box here, okay? Um, I had assured you that although we did this for discrete times, it's also valid for continuous times, okay? So we have to take that my word and then therefore, then this must be actually proportional to not delta t delta t but only delta t and therefore how do we get this right so every mm -hmm. algebraic step if you want this to get right what should happen 
there must be a square root here there must be a square root here there must be a square root here huh? there must be another square root at here which means there must be a square root here okay which means in the way we were doing this integration we must have a square root here does it make sense so let me write down how you should numeric if you trust what i have done the right way of numerically integrating stochastic model model is this n of t plus delta t is equal to approximately of course n of t plus f of n of t delta t plus sigma g of n all of it is fine until here eta t but you must multiply it by square root of delta t not delta t basically why are we doing this because the mean square displacement of a random walker is proportional to time not time square Does that make sense to anyone at all? Oh, what does it mean for uh, the population sizes? Sorry. So what does this mean for like if you are taking n as population and not? So what does this mean? That's a very good question. What this means is that if you had done like like the previous way, so what do you do to find new pop population changes, right? So to find population changes, you take the growth rate, right? And you multiply by delta t, right? That's the change in the growth population in that time unit, right? Now, what you have to do here is you have to multiply by you have to multiply by square root of delta t. What does it really mean? Think about this. Imagine delta t was zero point zero one. Imagine you found a random number. All of this coefficient was some ten. Okay, all of this coefficient was hypothetically ten. So, what will be the change because of randomness for this specific instant? To be ten times zero point zero one, this entire term will therefore become zero ten into zero point zero one. Right? How much will that be? It will be zero point one. That's the change in the population density in that small time interval. But now, this is if we had if we did not have a square root. But because you have a square root, what is square root of zero point zero one? So this is basically g of n. dt approach okay there you will get 0.1 as the change if you take the corrected approach which i have just told you you will get 10 times 10 is all of the stuff before the time interval stuff now what is square root of delta t delta t is 0.01 square root of delta t will be 0.1 what will that be it's actually 1 meaning if you had not taken the square root you were actually underestimating how strong the stochasticity was right you would have underestimated the effect of stochasticity if you don't account for the true randomness of the random variable so to write that down the naive numerical algorithm Underest, which has which has term like g of n, eta t times root of t, underestimates effects of stochasticity. Okay. That's what this means. Oh, naive is not this. Okay, the naive would be uh, this. This underestimates. The correct one doesn't underestimate. 
so i will stop here today i think uh, i covered quite a bit of ground but you know i will ask more questions people may have so uh, is this numerical uh, method the under root of delta t is like general for other cases also like where we have different functional forms or so yeah yeah shweb is the um what's the shweb do you remember the are there shweb i don't know if you are there maybe you can tell me what's the so shweb is not here but i think he is locked out i think it's maruyama or ma mayaruma I, i sort of get that uh, Uh, scheme. Okay, it also has a name. Uh, yeah, it works for all f and g's. Yeah, I mean all smooth functions of f and g's. It's not specific to what we are studying. So, it's so basically true only if uh, noise is modeled as Gaussian. Right? Ah, that's a good question. So now that request has addition. If you don't mind, I can I can explain that maybe at the end of other questions because that requires another small calculations to show why Gaussian is required is actually the uh, is the most meaningful uh, you know uh, noise to consider. Yeah. Assuming continuous processes, if the processes are continuous time processes, Gaussian noise is undoubtedly the right choice to. I'll just explain in a bit why. So can you tell the dimensions of eta? Because oh, that's a mess. So yeah, oh, so it's a bit of a mess. So you have to, <laughs> um, yeah. How do you how do you, how can I tell the dimensions? Because for g, it will be population per time. Yeah. So I will tell you what you know the dimension. What's your name by the way? Bharadaj. Ha. Huh. You are from which department? Chemical engineering. Ha. Huh. Okay. So yeah, so dimensions of it is a bit of a mess. So okay, the physicists and uh, mathematicians define it very differently. Okay, so physicists, mathematicians don't even define eta t at all. Okay, so they prefer the following approach. They prefer the following approach. They actually never write an equation of this form. So this is the physicist way of writing. equations whereas colleagues also use this um you know all all, all non mathematicians use this uh, except economists i think whereas mathematicians define a stochastic differential equation in this way they don't go to they don't do anything else they just define in this way where dw is a where they basically say that you can only define stochastic differential equations at a uh, for a time infinitely small time interval delta t okay this should be delta t no I shouldn't change the definition so okay okay um you can only define it you can never write a derivative term like this because the right hand side is not smooth eta t is not a smooth function at all So therefore, you can only write the differentials, okay, not the derivatives. So differential is given by this for an arbitrarily small delta t, where delta w follows is a Gaussian random number with mean zero and variance dt. And if you compare this with the numerical scheme, they match. Okay, so now you can sort of you know you can think of dimensions in this form or this form. It depends on. How you do? So I think you can work out the dimensions for eta. I, you know, if I try now, I will get it wrong, so I won't try. Yeah, the dw will have dimensions of under root dt. Yeah, yeah. So Because eta t has some inbuilt uh, time in it. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Eta eta t prime has, I think, the dimensions of time. Is that right? Something like that. You know, I I make mistakes, so but I think this is an easier way. When terms of dimension, it's sometimes easier. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So DW has to have a dimension of dt, hmm. uh, and eta t has. Okay, I'm, I'm going to. I was going to try. I think it must have one over no to get it right. Eta eta should have. Uh... So so basically, they also have one over dt on the left hand side, right? So hmm. it's a bit tricky. So it depends on what is g. Assuming additive noise, uh, 
it will then becomes one. It has no n dependence. So it depends on n now, you know, whether it's IIT one multiplicative noise, what's the form of G to some extent. Mm -hmm. so if G is dimensionless, then you can say something about it. Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? So the I you know Samir had a question, it's true only for Gaussian noises. So let's hypothetically assume what if theta t let's say is uniform or some other noise. Okay. So let's say I hypothetically I can write an equation like this. Okay. Let's say I can write an equation like this. So now let us say I want this. Okay, so what happens? So basically the mathematically correct way of writing it is this. And then Okay, this is the correct way of writing it. Okay, I was I we so before we even discretize. Now eta t was a what is eta t I mean? Which distribution you want? Pick whatever distribution you want. Okay. Um, what is the integration doing? So there is some eta, right? Some random. And then what is the integration doing? It's basically looking at the area below this very randomly changing curve, right? So another way of thinking of integration is that I calculate the value of eta at each time step. This integration can also be thought of as summation, right? Of eta of t i, whatever. If there are, if we divide the delta t into n time units, okay, I calculate this summation. Is that right? Is, do you agree that you know the integration can be thought of as summation? Assuming at least in the classical uh, integration sense. What is the summation of large number of independent random numbers? Do you know what is called central limit theorem? It always follows a normal distribution. Okay, with some variance. Okay, so therefore, uh, eta t anyway had a mean zero, therefore the resulting will also have a mean zero. Um, so, which is why uh, it doesn't matter even if you wanted to write an equation of this type with non-Gaussian non noise, when you do an integration and write an expression of this type, this will be a Gaussian random noise with an appropriate variance, okay? Does it explain for at least heuristically what happens? This is called central limit theorem. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, the moment we introduce stochasticity, we need lots of tools and techniques from probability theory. So, which is also why in the first course of theoretical ecology, no one ever usually does random uh, stochastic population dynamics. But I thought it's still useful to do because that's sort of one very good way to introduce realism into these models. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so we'll stop here. There are no more questions. We'll stop the recording and send the link.